call is now being recorded. Okay, good morning, everybody, to all the students here online, as well as those um, joined us on the e-learning. Today is our last class. Um, so just a note that we will not be having class next week. Okay, so today is our last class. We will. Is this better? Can you all hear me now? Yeah, I think you can. Yeah. Okay, so sorry. The, the students were just sharing about what they have learned. Yes, we've left with only Sri Radha now. Yes, Rita, what have you learned? Not to be judgmental. Not to be judgmental and uh, confidentiality is the main thing. Okay. We should not share. Like whatever the situation is, we should not share. Anything. Not share. Okay. 
All right. What about uh, the online students? I think there's Nina, Chira, Shivakumar, Jackin, Anthony. Um, what what are some things that you have picked up through the last 13 weeks? So you can put it on the chat if you don't want to. Um, Online students. OK, all right. I'm hoping that they, you'll have learned something and it's been helpful. OK, today we will um, we'll focus. We will, oh, one minute, sorry. There's a comment. One minute, I'm just uh, presenting this. There's a comment. OK. Uh, so Shivkumar said, learned how counseling is to be done. A lot of misunderstanding has been cleared. OK, good. Thank you. Thanks, Shivkumar. OK, so today we are going to wrap up. And we're going to, um, just like any other work that we do, there are some ethical guidelines that we need to follow, even when, even in counseling. Okay. Do you understand by what it means, what the word ethics mean? What is ethics? Fair practices. Very good. Or any kind of practices that actually that should not. Okay. So, so you're having certain guidelines that don't violate the person or you as a as a as a professional or even the relationship so that's what we we look at ethics so there are even ethics when you look at christian counseling there are certain ethics that is good to follow um, now this this has uh, again if we're looking at what ethics are it's certain principles that actually specify what is good and what may not be and it also classifies what you can do what you should not be doing it helps you see what is right what is wrong and how we can apply some of those beliefs okay so we're going to be looking at what some of these ethics are and as even as people uh, not just as prof counselors but even as people it's good to actually follow some of these practices okay so we look at uh, professional ethics so as as it's written here what is ethics it's the standards that actually govern your conduct as a counselor uh, and how you operate in this uh, through this uh, through through these uh, sessions or through anything that you may be doing okay okay so quickly just looking at uh, why our code of ethics ne uh, necessary why is it important for us to have this? One, it gives you a common set of beliefs and values, right? Everyone knows that these are certain practices that we need to follow. Okay. All right. And we, uh, and so when they're specified, there is no ambiguous ambiguity in it. There isn't a question as, oh, should I be saying yes to this? Should I be saying no to that? So there is a set of beliefs and set of standards that we follow. Now, even as we are talking about set of standards and beliefs, um, Christian counseling is based on what? On, on scripture, on scripture, right? On biblical guidelines, on biblical scripture, on the person of Jesus Christ, his revelation in both the Old and the New Testament. So that's the base. And that's where we get our guidelines also from. Okay, so, so nothing um, that is contrary to the word uh, is, is, even, is even practiced ethically. OK? All right. So going back, what are some of the, uh, um, uh, what are some of the needs? Or what, why should we have uh, these ethicals? Like I said, it gives you a certain standard. It tells you how you can, how you should be behaving as a counselor. What kind of care should you be taking care of? What are some of those practices that you have to keep in, in uh, um, check? 
Now, when there are some ethics, it also reassures the people, the counselee who is actually sitting in front of you, right? Like, for example, one of the ethical considerations is confidentiality. So when a counselee is sitting in front of you, they don't have to keep fearing the fact that, OK, will this counsellor go and share this? Because it's, it's a guideline. It's a practice that whatever they share here will be uh, maintained. So it is a practice. And so it gives the re reassurance to the um, people who actually come to you. It also gives you gives yourself a protection, OK? Um, because you're, you also know that there are, you are bound by certain ethics, by, bound by certain guidelines, and you, you should not be violating that. So it's almost like a protective factor also for you. Like I'll give you for example, um, let's say you have broken confidentiality of someone who, um, who's spoken about wanting to commit suicide. All right. Uh, and let's say someone puts a legal case on you saying that as a counselor, she, uh, you know, breached confidentiality. But you're protected because under the ethical guidelines, if they are harm to themselves or harm to somebody else, you can breach that confidentiality. Got that? So you're also protected among these ethical guidelines. Got that? Okay. The next is it uh, reflects counseling as a profession. Like we were talking, you know, everyone does counseling. You go to anyone, they'll say, I counseled so and so, right? But it is actually a skill based profession. It's something that is a profession. And, uh, and, and everyone and anyone does not do that without actually being prepared or learning the skills, right? So you need to be equipped with the skills, with the knowledge, with the understanding, with biblical guidance to become a Christian counselor. All right. Okay. Next is it actually raises the quality of practice. So what does that mean? That because these, like, if you have a certain boundary, you know where you have to be, you know, where you have to play, right? You don't play outside of it. And so you know that these are certain things that is needed. Like, for example, when you're dealing with a counselee, mm. uh, you know, when they're talking and crying, you have to be paying attention. You're using the skills of attending. You're using the skills of responding. That's how you're raising that quality of care. And lastly, it also gives a place where people can um, bring about complaints of a counselor, of how they are, of, of what it is. Now, in India, we specifically don't have an association uh, for ethical guidelines. So this has been borrowed by the uh, American Association um, guidelines. Okay, it's been borrowed from that. But in general, these are certain practices that we need to uh, ensure. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so what is the mission? The mission is to ensure that you have an ethical framework from where you can operate so that you're ensuring the dignity and care of any person who comes to you for help. So a couple of things. There's a framework. OK, there is uh, uh, you are offering dignity and care for those who are coming to you and those who are receiving your services. So that's what the mission of this ethical guideline is. All right. If you look at uh, scripture, again, there are there is a scriptural admonition for all of us or for for those especially in this kind of a ministry to be able to um, ensure that we take care of of the needs of others to bear others burdens and so when we bear the others burdens what does it say we fulfill the law of christ right we fulfill what god came to do what Jesus came to do when we bear each other's burdens. Again, in Galatians 6.10, it says, good to all people, especially to those in the household of faith. So people in problems, in struggle, do it, do good to them. Again, in Philippians, it says, um, uh, do not merely look at your own personal interests, but at the interests of other people. So it is, it's something that the Bible also tells us to do 
is to bear each other's burdens, to do good, to ensure that we are helping others, but within a framework, within a guideline. Okay? Francis, are you here? Okay. All right. Okay. So we're going to be looking at, um, at some guidelines, and there are seven in all. Okay? So we will look, look at e seven of these ethics. So here are it's it's just a list first, and then we will get into um, uh, each of them. So there is compassion, there's competence, consent, confidentiality, cultural regard, collegiality, and community presence. Okay, so we will discuss each of this in detail. Okay, right. So let's look at the first one. It's compassion in Christian counseling. And it is, uh, what does it call us to do? It calls us to be servants, to, to have a heart of servanthood. So in Christianity or in Christian, just look at what Jesus did. What was the hallmark of his ministry? What is the most important thing in his ministry? Compassion. People, yeah. So, yes. So it was. It was that to give to others, to bear each other's burdens. So compassion and service is is the main point of Christian, and so it should also be of um, Christian counseling as well. So counselors should proactively look at being compassionate rather than exploiting, discriminating, or even uh, uh, um, bringing about any kind of harm. So how do you bring harm? How could you bring harm to your counseling? Yes. Yeah, when you... When you uh, when you character assassinate them, when you judge them, when you give wrong advice, right? It could probably mean more harm than it is. It, it's actually helpful. So that's why, that's what we're looking when we're saying about compassionate service, not giving any suggestion that can actually be really more harmful. Like I'll give you a simple example. Uh, let's say in a marriage, a wife comes to you, okay? And um, for example, let's say they are going through violence in the house. The husband is, uh, there's domestic violence. And in case your suggestion is something like, you know, you must continue staying there, serve him, uh, be faithful, just keep praying. Uh, you know, even if he beats you, just keep praying. What could that do? Yeah, so it can harm, right? So you've got to be extremely careful on how you make those suggestions. And sometimes we make suggestions without even knowing the full truth. right? So being very, very careful about how and what you do. And that's exactly why you don't give suggestions. You get them, draw from them what is it that may be useful for them in their situation. OK, all right. So you must be aware of the, uh, the, the influence that you as a counselor have the spiritual influence as well as the social influence you as a counselor can have. Because people do tend to look up to, let's say, a pastor or a counselor or a leader, isn't it? And then they take that advice. But then it needs to come with uh, that sense of compassion and service. All right? Got that? So that's what we're looking at, compassion in Christian counseling. Now, just to, just to also, again, highlight a few things, we need to remember that as counselors, we do not support certain things. Abortion, okay, separation and divorce, we don't support and assist, all right? But there could be times that the person chooses to, all right, and we, let, we allow that freedom for them to do so, okay? We, separation. separation and divorce. Right, so there may be a t maybe something like, for example, um, let's say adultery. Okay, 
maybe the council comes in and says that they have decided that they they would like a divorce you are not assisting them to do it all right but you you are taking them through that journey that doesn't mean all because you are sorry yeah that is something you don't do you're not you're, you're not there advocating it or things like that but then if they make that choice you help them through that journey that's what it means you don't support and assist them to do that okay a premarital or extramarital sexual behavior we don't support assist condone that substance abuse and other substance abuse is things like alcoholism drug addiction or any other addictive behavior homosexual bisexual transgendered behavior euthanasia and assisted suicide you know what euthanasia is it's to a decision to kill one to end one's own life okay like i think it's in germany if i'm not mistaken in some country it's made legal mercy killing yeah um, you you choose to die you you can make that decision that you you want to die right so that's something that as counselors we do not support or advocate okay all right okay with the first one second one is competence um what do you what do you mean by the word competence do you know what the meaning of competence is competence is mainly um how you work the way that you work um the the kind of excellence that you put into your work all right so in christian counseling the call is to be a competent counselor so what does being a competent counselor mean huh yeah so you 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 doing all the best that you can to help someone so which means if you do not know how to do it one is you have to learn or step back and Uh, uh, let someone else do it because you, remember this is the it's a life of a person right we can't be taking it lightly so if you feel there is you do not have a competence ensuring that you pick up the skills and the ability to do that so that you have you're excellent in your work okay so you are honoring the call to be an excellent uh, worker or an excellent professional um so it it what what does this also mean is that um you are also um knowing and respecting the boundaries of competence which means you you know what is it that you're able to do what is it that you're not able to to do what is it that you may give to someone else so you are maintaining the highest standards even of integrity that is you're being honest you're being authentic in the way that you offer um whatever help or support that you are giving okay okay now what is this call to excellence remember um there are some guidelines again for for example let's suppose you go back to your own homes okay and there isn't a um what do you say there isn't a availability of someone like a counselor like a christian counselor you're probably one among the very few so what can you do if you do find yourself in a place where you feel you're not competent you can consult somebody else and get the support or get something like a supervision so that you can get the best help that you want all right or you can uh, refer to those maybe others that are there outside now christian counselors remember do not counsel or advise against professional counseling so for example they are also going to a secular counselor okay and the secular counselor is maybe telling them something what our call to excellence is not to say no 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 don't follow them they are after money they don't know what they are doing you know just keep away don't take those medicines don't do what they're saying you know come here under the guidance got that okay but you can, you can what you what you what you should be doing is to really understand what kind of support they're getting from there 
and to allow them to make that decision about that support. So as it's written here, you, you as a Christian counselor do not counsel, do not counsel or advise against professional counseling, medical or psychiatric treatment, use of medications, legal counsel, or other forms of professional service merely because they be, because you believe such practice is wrong or because the person who's providing this is not a Christian. All right? Is that clear? So we've got to be very careful of how we excellently work without really putting a, um, uh, uh, an issue for, for others who are working in the profession. All right? Francis, all right? Yeah. What? All right. OK. The third one is consent. Consent in Christian counseling, which is a call to integrity. So what is the meaning of consent? Permission. Consent is permission. Permission? Kind of. OK. You're taking permission. Yeah, an agreement or a permission. Okay. So in Christian counseling, it is very important to take consent, informed consent. And that is why all those who come to us for counseling in Chrysalis, they fill up a form and they give us a signature saying that they consent to the practices of Chrysalis, which is where we do say that we we are scriptural and we do follow. Um, uh, scriptural and biblical guidelines and principles. So then they do sign that. Okay. So it's getting consent. Also, consent for the structure and process of counseling. Sometimes they may want to know, um, they've come with multiple issues, but they don't want to deal with some, they want to deal with only a few. And so taking that consent that, okay, we will talk about only this and that, right? And not, not really delve into things that they may be that they may not want to talk to. So that's what we're looking at, consent of the structure and process of counseling. Next is consent from parents, legal guardian, or counselee representative. Like if it's a minor, right? You take the consent from a parent. Uh, documentation of consent, which is like a written document. And then consent for biblical and spiritual practices and counselling, that you're taking consent that we are going to be looking only at guidelines from scripture. So if they're not, if they don't feel that's something that they want to do, they're free not to take the service. Okay? Any questions? Okay. Do you have a question? Ah, oh, okay. Okay, so on person, like, no, I'll ask later. Man. You'll ask Please later, more. you'll plan the question in your head. Okay, so what all did we look at up to now? Compassion, competence. competence. Okay, competence is excellence, and then consent. Okay, all right, okay. So that's consent. Good. Consent means integrity, right? OK. Next is collegiality. What is collegiality? It is you are recognizing and valuing the benefit of forming effective relationships with other people. Okay, the collegiality, like the word colleagues, it comes from the word colleagues. Okay, that you um, have good relationships and good working relationship with other people. Like maybe as a counselor, you may need to work closely with a pastor, right? You may need to work closely with, let's say, uh, um, probably other, other uh, maybe someone in a hospital, maybe like a doctor. Right, so having that a call to relationship to ensure that whatever you do, you're doing it with 
uh, absolute uh, meekness and humility. So this can include other mental health practitioners. It can include ministry leaders in the community. It can include uh, mentors, mentees. It can include educators. Maybe the person, uh, there's a teacher, there is a, um, a school, college, right? So it can it can come in all of this. So basically, it is cooperating and respecting the thoughts and the uh, uh, the the work that they bring into the person in question. Okay. You remember your question? Okay. Ten. So we discussed like we should not like promote the divorce, uh, but in like Christian marriage and family, we learned about like uh, if it's another own relationship, it's yeah. okay to divorce. So yeah. how it like connecting? You're not the one who's advocating it. No, like to counseling, like one person is like shouting like as I need to divorce. This is the problem. Correct. So if your counselee comes with the need to divorce. What you are, through your practice, you're helping them see other ways in which we can resolve this issue. Okay? So you try and come help them to look at other alternatives. If still they decide to make that choice, they make the choice. So they still make the choice. You're not... You, you're not the one suggesting, say, okay, I think there's nothing else to do but have a divorce. Yeah, it, is, it should come from the person themselves, right? It's not that we support and say, you know, any, any individual, anyone, that becomes the first solution. That's what I mean to say. You're right that there may be some points that nothing else will work but a divorce. But allowing the counselee to come to a point to make that informed decision themselves okay all right the next one is confidentiality in christian counseling it is a call to trustworthiness now confidentiality like we all like you all know it's the ability to keep um, in confidence everything that is shared to you so when you are confidential what are you doing you are recognizing that your counselee has the right to the fundamental right to keep private all that they have shared with you. It is their right to have it um, shared with you. And the very fact that they have come and opened themselves out to you is a feeling of be feeling of wanting you uh, wanting to be trusted and wanting to give their trust in you. Okay, so it's that call to trustworthiness. So when, they, when someone's come to you with their problems, it's for us a call to be trustworthy, that we do not give away any kind of information. So what the person can be bringing in could be their personal thoughts, their opinions, their beliefs, their behaviors. And we are, we are ensuring that they, they're protected from any kind of a public view or public opinion. Okay? Confidentiality? Yes? Okay. Next is cultural regard in Christian counseling. It's a call to dignity. So especially in India, where we have a huge number of cultures. So what are we called to do? We are to recognize that all people have been created in the image of God, and they all have a right to be valued and respected, no matter what culture they come from, what background they come from, we give them the utmost respect and dignity that is due to them. And all because they may not be as part of our culture or they may not be doing things the way that we do, they are due for disrespect. Okay? So that's what we mean by cultural regard. Like, for example, let's suppose a person who... Um, um, Let's say a somebody from the LGBTQ community comes to you, right? We treat them with absolute dignity and care and compassion. Okay? What happened, Anand? Okay. 
So again, what is this call to dignity? Yeah. So, yeah, you so remember. Yeah, respecting is not uh, agreeing. It's not even support. It's agreeing with their ideas. It's not uh, agreeing, right? It doesn't mean agreement. Yeah, we respect. We love them for who they are, right? We may not. Uh, agree or condone their behaviors, but as people, they are people. Treat them with dignity. You had something to say? No. Okay. So when we're looking at uh, this cultural um, uh, um, regard, uh, it's important for us to have a knowledge of various cultural practices and worldviews. Like, for example, let's say an atheist comes to you. It's good to know what atheists believe in. Or an agnostic comes to you. It's good to know what they believe in. Or a Buddhist comes to you. Just have an idea about what they have so that you're also sensitive while you are helping. Right? Like, for example, uh, let's say someone who believes in idols come to you. Believes in idols, idol, idols come to you. Right? So in your counseling, if you're going to go say, you know, believing in idols, I mean, worshipping idols is a sin. What's going to happen? They won't come again. Uh, right? And because we need to be sensitive about what they believe in. Not that, if, not that we must change them then and there and make them, you know, a believer and a spirit-led Christian. That's and salvation. It's not that. It's to meet them at their point of need. She must be coming to you with some parenting issues and she said, oh, I prayed to my idol also. And then you say, oh, believing in idols is a sin. Right? So being very sensitive and the, uh, the one way of doing that is to actually know about different cultural practices. Yeah. On this Christian leaders, Christian counselors and all, so uh, there is one comment like they they changes into Christians. Uh, um, uh, they just show this counseling or some compassion or some few things. They'll show few things and they'll changes. Hmm. Uh, so on the process, what is what should be our answer? So um, and that's why there is this consent that is there saying that we follow scriptural principles we follow the bible right and there are so even among christian counselors there are different kinds of groups so there is a certain group of people a group of counselors who will admonish you according to the word whether you're a believer or not a believer okay they will admonish you on the word they say this is not what the bible says and that's not what you should be doing right and so it's making reference to probably people like that because there are there is a group of counselors who do that, right? However, we our principles are there. Nevertheless, we don't condone, we don't assist anyone in doing that. But we are open to helping them look at something different, to look at a, at a different side. So it depends on which framework you come from. Uh, if, if you are counseling a non-Christian, what is the biblical boundary for us to not go beyond that as a Christian counselor. Mm. So we have uh, this uh, influence right on Bible, Jesus teachings mm. and whatever all. Mm. So what should be the biblical boundary for us mm. if, it, if it is a non-Christian, if the counselee is a non-Christian? So one is remember free will that they should be, they should make the choice and be in agreement that they are willing to take on the teachings or the or principles in Christianity, right? We should never override that will, right? That is when we override a will, that's when it becomes more like a force that becomes more uh, pushed onto them. But knowing that they have a free will, but even in counseling, like we were talking about, remember we spoke about disclosure. Disclosure is where the counselor can bring about some personal stories about the way things have changed for them, depending on what you're talking about, right? So there, 
you have the right to say this is what my story has been. So if they express interest as a result of that is when you can open up a conversation. If they say, no, I'm not too much of a believer in it, I don't want to. So you could say, you know, would you like to explore what the Bible says? Or do you want, would you like to explore what Christianity looks at? They may say, no, I'm not interested. So you let, you respect that. Okay, so when we're looking at cultural regard, this is something we need to find. Uh, look at is how do we work with persons of different faiths, religions, and values? So counselors share their own faith only as a function of legitimate self-disclosure. That's what I mentioned. Only when you're in a place of disclosing, a self-disclosure, and when appropriate to the counselee's need. Right? So you're not going to do this with every counselor is sharing your faith and bringing them to salvation prayer. No. Okay? Uh, while you always maintain a posture of hum hu humility. Again, when you work with people of different religions, you're not imposing your values. Okay? While Christian counselors may expose counselees to their faith orientation, you do not impose your beliefs or practices to them. Okay, You are making them open. Like, for example, even when they come to the church office, they're seeing the environment there. They're seeing verses. They're seeing someone praying for them. right? They are exposed to the orientation, but they're not imposed with beliefs and practices. OK? So. All right? Is that clear? OK. Next one. Uh, case management in Christian counseling. Now, case management, what is the, the word case management means? Every person you see, you don't, um, like when you go to a factory and you're making something, let's say making biscuits, is there any difference from one biscuit packet and the other biscuit packet? Your, your, there's no difference. Actually, there isn't a difference. It's all the same, right? You're manufacturing biscuit. Okay. In a factory. Good day biscuit. Good day butter biscuit. And there are... Butter. All butters are the same. <laughs> okay, that's what I said, right? Yeah. So, but when you're looking at it in Christian counseling, each person or each case, I know it sounds very... Impersonal when you say case, but case management is a term that you use in counseling. Each person is has a uh, has a unique or a, uh, what's the word um, customized way of dealing with them. Right? You are not following a yeah no one to ten process. No, each person is different, and that's that's what helps in Christian counseling. So comprehensive and thorough case management always considers the whole person. That is, their biological factors, psychological, emotional, cognitive, social, cultural, relational, spiritual. Because every person is a mix of all of this, all of these factors. All right? So it, it's important that we ensure that we look at all of these areas to give them the best service that is possible. So that's what we mean by case management. So every case, a person that comes to you is considered uniquely looking at all of these factors so we can curate a plan or a program or a treatment for them that is specifically needed for their individual needs. OK? And the last one is community presence in Christian counseling. And it is what uh, it is a call to humility. What does that mean? Where we are, we are we are aware that we are playing a larger role in our community or or in our society. Okay, so we have, as the Bible tells us, we are called to be salt. And light, we're called to be God's amb ambassadors. And whatever we do, we do it for the honor and for the glory of God.
OK? So let me go back to those. Yeah, so it's compassion, competence, consent, confidentiality, oh, sorry, cultural regard, collegiality, and community presence. OK, so these are the ethics that we need to take care of. OK, any questions? Community presence. Let me go by. Go to that. Okay. So in what? Huh? This one, right? Yeah. So wherever we are placed, we need to be, yeah, salt and light. We are aware that our influence is just not with the counselee, but it is also with the larger community their fam the, the, the counselee's family, maybe their church. And so we are called to be the salt and light as God's ambassadors so that we will adopt and we will, we will offer uh, practices or services or support or help in a way that brings God glory, right? That really brings about who we are as believers. Okay? Because we're just not serving one person. Through that one person, we are serving a community. Okay, so, so people in the community that they see you, you must be salt and light. Okay? All right. Any questions? Okay. So the last part is going to be boundaries and what should we uh, take care of, what we should be aware of. Okay? We'll start that in, in, in the next hour. Yeah, so we'll stop for a break and come back at 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm.